Hello, my name is Dr. George Sparks, and you are watching Digging the Bible. You know, today I'm going to talk about one of the well-known stories or the epics in the Old Testament, the epic of Samson and Delilah. We're going to look at the biblical text along with a lot of artifacts from the room of a thousand artifacts, and we have brought some out, some very rare, very unique uh, artifacts from before the time period of the judges and slightly after. But I think you'll find this very interesting, so stay with me. This will be a very interesting program. We're going to first look at who are the Philistines and where were they from. Now, according to the Internet, if you ever Googled uh, the word the Philistines, I'm just going to simply read to you, the Bible describes the land of the Philistines as a pentopolis, meaning five, in the southwest Levant comprising the five city-states of Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. From the Wadi Gaza to south to the Yukon, Yukon River in the north. Several biblical passages connect the Philistines to other biblical groups such as the Kaftarim, which have both been identified with Crete and which has led to the tradition of an Algean origin, or really what we're saying is the ancient Greek origin. Although this theory has been disputed. In 2016, the discovery of a huge Philistine cemetery containing more than 150 burials seems to point towards this Algean origin of this Philistine culture. The genetic testing of the human remains will provide further information. This is a map we have of the Philistine cities and their attempt to conquest what we would say the land occupied by Israel. If you look at the Philistine the Philistine cities, they are actually occupying what we call the coastal plain, such as Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and of course Gath. This is called, once again, the coastal plain. As you go further inland towards the land which we will call occupied by Israel, you have the foothills, which is called in the Bible the Shafila or the Shafela. All right, and then we get to the hill country where we have Hebron and Jerusalem and Shechem. This would be in the hill country. The Philistines are said to arrive early in the 12th century BCE, during the time period of, a, of an Egyptian pharaoh known as Ramses III. Now, not Ramses the Great, Ramses the Second of the the Exodus but this is Ramses III. So we're talking around the 12th century BC, all right? So around 1180, these invading Philistines, which simply means sea people, arrived along the Levant and they entered into the North Nile Delta, not just by land, but also by sea. So what you have depicted here in an Egyptian carving is a sea battle, Egyptians against the sea people, the Philistines. And we can actually take a look, of, look at this carving and see the difference of how the Egyptians dressed and their weapons of warfare compared to how the Philistines are dressed and their weapons. Here's a close-up. Notice the Philistines have this large feathered style headdress, which actually makes them look taller and maybe even more fierce. Here's an excavation at Tel El Safi, uh, or S-A-F-I, Safi, and we have an uh, excavation of human remains, possibly even Philistines. And we can take a look at these vessels and basically date it to, like you say, early Iron Age period. We have some bracelets and we have a little uh, type of uh, dipper juglet on the bottom next to the skeleton's uh, skull. Here we have a distance where you can see they are digging inside a bulk. All right, this is called a balk, and they're going down layers, and these layers are called strata. So at this particular layer, which could be Iron Age or might, maybe even part of the Late Bronze Age, the end of the Late Bronze Age, we, or they have found a skeleton. But look, she is going at it with a little pick, maybe a little brush, and he's blowing away the dust. This is very time-consuming. So if you ever want to go to an excavation, understand, don't be impatient. You're going to take your time and uncover things, hopefully, of biblical significance. 
This is a cool picture here. This, this lady is actually brushing off and cleaning a human skull, possibly a skull of, a, of an ancient Philistine. In the distance, you can see them uncovering an amphora, a large storing jar, and how tedious it's going to take. Once they find the top of the storing jar, look how they're just digging around it to make sure that they don't damage the structure, damage the vessel. And here's a number of different vessels that they have uncovered from the, the dig site Tel Es Safi, which is ancient Gath, which is ancient Gath, okay? So here we have a number of different vessels. So at this time, we're going to go over to the room of a thousand artifacts, and you're going to join me there, and we're going to look at very similar artifacts. So here we are in the room of a thousand artifacts, and if you look at the picture, you're going to see some Cypro Phoenician type artifacts with a red slip and dark red circles. And here we have a similar vessel right here to what was uncovered at the dig. And this is going to date to the Iron Age period. So we're just going to generally say that this is early Iron Age 1, 1200 to 1000 BCE. And in Iron Age 2, usually 1,000 to around 586. So we go Iron Age uh, 2 and then 3. But that's the time period that we could be looking at when we look at the Iron Age in general for this uh, one lecture. Here we have a very rare example of an iron dagger. You know, the Bible says that the Philistines were, you could say, brought the idea or the technology of making iron. See, iron isn't like poured, it is actually forged. So the idea of mixing metals together and heating them up and pouring them together like bronze, all right, that isn't how you would make iron. Some scholars actually would say that the uh, Israelites did not gain the knowledge of how to make iron weapons until the time period of King David. Because King David at one time would live among or hide among the the uh, Philistines when he was fleeing from King Saul. So it could have been during this time that the Israelites gained the knowledge of how to make iron weapons, but it's still, still very rare. But here in what we call the Iron Age I period around 1200 to 1000 BCE, we have found an archaeological tell. When we find it in the place of origin, we call it in situ. In situ, an iron dagger. All right. Now, what blows this theory of 1200 BC, the beginning of Iron Age? Actually, they found an iron dagger in the tomb of King Tut, which dates to almost a century prior to around 1320, 1330 BCE. So there are little enigmas to this Iron Age theory as well. But a very rare iron dagger. Why is it so rare? Because iron rusts. Here we have some vessels, and these are called stirrup jars because of their odd-shaped handles. Their origins seem to be, again, Algean. The stir stirrup jars, their, you could say, their construct, their design, appears to be Algean. And as the Philistines migrate into what we call the land of Canaan, they bring with them the designs of the pottery from the origin of which they were located. So we can actually track these people by looking at the designs of their potteries, which we find at the excavations at certain areas, which we call bulks and strata levels, where we, for instance, saw that skeleton, or possibly even in a tomb. Tombs are where we find the most crispest of all, all pottery. It's usually intact where we, when we go to a dig site, it's probably crushed under a lot of earth and debris. But, howbeit, we're looking at stirrup jars. The one, the small one is actually an ancient Greek Mycenaean style where the one on the right is what we call local imitation. In other words, it's the same style, but it's made out of local Canaanite clay, which is more coarse. And, uh, and the painting design is not as crisp as what the ancient Greeks were using. So they're easily distinguished between the two. Here we also have some vessels from, we could say, the uh, early Iron Age, the late Bronze Age, and I'm gonna show you a very similar vessel. It looks like a canteen, but in archaeology, we cannot say canteen. That's too, you know, too now. We have to use our own language, so we call them a pilgrim's flask, a pilgrim's flask. And here is a very rare example of a pilgrim's flask. This one actually dates to the late Bronze Age, 1550 to 1200 BC. The Philistines 
seem to arrive around 1200 BC, all right, 1180, but they still bring very similar designs of pottery style, such as this one right here. Once again, it's called a pilgrim's flask. Another type of pottery that seems to arrive with the Philistines is called a pyxis. A pyxis could be used for storing perfume. Once again, look at the design. Okay, this is what we call monochrome, one color. It's got an earthen style slip to it, kind of a light brown, with a dark brown paint. So it's only one color, monochrome. Once again, this is local imitation. This is not Mycenaean ancient Greek, but it's an imitation of that pottery from possibly the late Bronze Age period, most definite. Now, if we take these two pieces and show them together, they are probably, they probably came from the very same tomb. Look how identical the slip is along with the brown painting designs. So, two very large examples and very rare of what ancient pilgrim's flask and pyxis look like to help identify the origins, if you will, of the Philistine people. And here we have a selection of pottery. Uh, also, early, early Philistine. Now, the very early Philistine uh, pottery seems to be, once again, monochrome, one color on a very light slip. But it is very similar to the Algean pottery of the place of the origin, possibly Crete, okay? From Kaftor, as the Bible would call it. Now, as you can look at that whole piece called a crater, this is actually in the Mancini Museum. Um, I could actually, someday I'll pick it up and I'll come and bring it to the program. It is one of the largest pieces of ancient Philistine pottery that I know to exist. Then we have little fragments of pottery. Once again, these circular patterns, but it's only monochrome. Now, later on in the Iron Age I period, the Philistines start to make pottery with more than one type of color, and we call that bichrome. So the early, early settlements of the Philistine, according, according to Lawrence Steger of Harvard University, who digs at Ashkelon with the support of the Leon Levy Foundation, all right, claims that when we see the monochrome pottery, 3C1B is what they call it. It's got a little number and letters to it, all right, uh, is dating to the first 50 years of the Philistine settlements. That's how much they got this down in the dating. First 50 years of settling the Philistines, they brought with them this monochrome style of pottery. As they become influenced through the Canaanites in the Phoenician style pottery, it becomes uh, bichrome. Now let me show you a fragment, as you see in the picture here, of bichrome pottery. This piece was actually donated to the collection brought by Trudy Dotan, one of the leading Philistine archaeologists in Israel today. Now, if you want to read a good book on the ancient Philistines, this is one right here. Once again, by Trudy and Moshe Dothan. People of the sea. What does Philistine mean? Sea people. And look at the picture. You have the Philistines on a boat along with the Egyptians. You can see the different style of headdresses and weaponry and shields. And the reverse cover, you see, very similar. And this is from an Egyptian tomb painting, or really a monument painting. Now, once again, pottery is very important for archaeologists because with that, in this case, according to Lawrence uh, Steger, we can date the Philistines within 50 years of their settlement pattern. Now, the bichrome pottery. I showed you one shard, but this is bichrome pottery. This is a a selection that is actually in the Israel Museum, dates to 1200 to around 1000 BCE, all right? And we have uh, on one side actually a beer strainer. The Philistines were notorious for their beer and their wine, basically the beer. And then we have in the center, once again, a stirrup jar with that funny little shaped handle, all right, and the spout. Remember, it originates from uh, Crete, ancient Mycenaean Greek culture, in the Algean, and then as they begin to migrate, they bring with them this particular style. And also we have the two a cup and also a larger vessel, which we call a crater, with very, very colorful designs. Now in Judges 3 and 1, I'm going to begin to read. Israel again did that was evil in the sight of Jehovah, and Jehovah delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. 
Now, if you've been with me on some of the earlier programs, understand when the Bible actually gives dates, we have to be very, very careful. Are those actual years to be represented or are they symbolic? Because they were in the wilderness, remember, for 40 years before they go into the promised land. And many times in the Bible when we read about 40 days and 40 nights, it can be very symbolic for an unknown length of time period. And that's one way the ancient Near Eastern people expressed that. Well, how long were they in the wilderness? Or how long was Jesus actually fasting? You know? And they might say, well, a long time, 40 days and 40 nights. Or you might be even you know, more current, say, well, how many thieves? Well, we have Alibaba and 40 thieves. Well, how many thieves? Just a lot. So 40 in the ancient Near East could not just be a literal, but also as a symbolic, used as a symbolic number as well. So it could be that 40 years, or Israel was under the bondage of the Philistines for well over 40 years, just a long length of time. Judges 13 and 2, and there was a certain man named man of Zorah of the family of the Danites. Remember the tribe is Dan, Danites whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren. Verse 4, now therefore be aware. Now remember that Manoah and his wife are going to have a baby, and they're going to call his name Samson. But there's a vow that they got to keep, that the son, their son, has to be rit ritually clean. And the text is going to explain that, but I want to lead into this one verse, verse 4. Now therefore be aware, drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. Now, why is that? Because by what you eat in the ancient culture and by what you drink could be some, uh, uh, because it's not just symbolic, but be used for designating a certain place in society, especially in the Israelite society. See, the pagans would eat and drink when they would worship at their cults. And they believed when they were intoxicated, you'll never read about a word intoxicated, they believed that they were filled with another spirit of their gods. So if an Israelite was in a, uh, a position, a priestly position, a position of a prophet or a judge, you were supposed to be exempt yourself, exempt yourself from drinking anything that would be strong. Why? Because that's what the pagans do. Because if you were to say, thus saith our God, all right, they would say, well, which God are you talking about? Because you're eating and you're drinking like the pagans. Is that a pagan God? You could say, no, I'm ritually clean. I don't eat the same thing, and I'm not drinking the same thing. Oh, so you're of the origin of the Israelites who worship the God, Yahweh. And they would say, yes. No razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and Jehovah blessed him. And the spirit of Jehovah began to move, move him in Machana Dan, between Zorah and Eshtol. Now, sometimes we've got to be very careful in the words that are used, because words can be symbolic as well, and have somewhat irony and double meaning, and we, and, and, which makes the story even more, you could say, strong once we understand this. Now, be, it begins with a capital M, Mahana, Dan. Remember, Dan means judge. Mahana also means tents and camps. So understand that the Philistines are living on the seacoast, and look at their pottery, and they have brought with them the technology of iron. They are advanced. They are on the seacoast. They are the beach boys of their time period, and the Israelites are kind of concerned about losing their youth, their young people, to the innovations of that oncoming coastal people called the Philistines. Will our young people leave to be a part of them? Because if they do, we'll lose our ethnic origin, along with the way they, we worship our God, Yahweh. You can see the concern. But understand, here in the text, Mahanadan, the Israelites, at least in the location of Dan, are still living in tents. And yet the Philistines come with this new technology. Now, very, very close to the stomping ground of Samson is a large tell called Beth Shemesh. The word Beth means house. The word Shemesh means like to be brilliant like the sun. And the word Shemesh is just Hebrew for the very word that we're using so much in this particular text, Samson. Samson is Shemesh. Now, I'm not saying he comes from Beth Shemesh, 
but he comes from that territory of the town, the city of Beth Shemesh. And Samson went down to Timnah. So uh, you can think that Beth Shemesh is in the hill country along, you can, might even say in the foothills, there's Shephelah, and he's going to go down into the valleys where Timnah is at because the, the, the Philistines live in the coastal plain area in the flatlands. And he saw a woman in Timnah, the daughters of the Philistines. And Samson told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said, Is there never a woman among the daughters of Israel that you go to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? He's supposed to be a judge of Israel, but yet he's going to marry a Philistine. But his father and his mother knew not that it was Jehovah, for he sought an occasion against the Philistines. So he's getting ready to use Samson's youth or his uh, neglect uh, to actually avenge the Israelites against the Philistines. There's the little irony in there. Then went Samson and his father and his mother to Timnah, which is a Philistine city, and came to the vineyards of Timnah, and a young lion roared against him. The spirit of Jehovah came mightily upon him, and he rent, his, rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand. But he told not his father or his mother what he had done. So he actually killed a lion. You might even say in self-defense. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. And he took it in his hand, and he is eating it as he went. And he gave to his father and his mother and gave to them, and they did eat. But he told not them, he told them not, that he had taken the honey out of the body of the lion. Now, why? Because one of the uh, vows, the commitments of somebody in the position of a Nazarite is you do not touch anything dead or unclean. He just defiled himself, number one. He broke the promise, number one. He touched something unclean to get something that was sweet, to get something that he wanted, as if he was going to the Philistines again to be with somebody that is unclean because that's what he wanted. Here's an actual Philistine right on, uh, it's a, a drinking vessel from Tel Kassil, right outside Tel Aviv today, all right? But you look at it very, very carefully, and it's the depiction of a lion. This is a call stand from Ta, Ta Anak. Um, on the very bottom, archaeologists call this the lion lady goddess of the vineyard. So simply the lion lady. And we see her name come up, or symbols of who she is, many times in artifacts uh, that we find in archaeological digs. At the very bottom of this uh, cult stand, you'll see a woman, and on either side, a lion. So she is the lion lady. So the idea that Samson is killing a lion when he's going to meet this Philistine woman can be very much symbolic, as if he defiled himself with the lion lady, or the culture that worships the lion lady, the Philistines, so that he can get something sweet from that culture. In Israel, you hear the prophets ranting and raving about uh, Baal and the Asherah and idols, and the Hebrews are worshiping and setting up different images of these gods. Why are the prophets doing this? Because the Hebrews were worshiping different idols, okay? This is one called the Asherim, or the Asherah. Many Asherim have been found in the vicinity of Jerusalem the same city where God placed his house. Also, we have the notorious Baal, Baal, the Canaanite god of fertility. All gods in ancient culture are gods of fertility. And if you think about this to the Hebrews, so was Jehovah. Because they're going to go from the land of the desert to a land which is called the land of milk and honey. Even Jehovah is a fertility god, but how do you receive that fertility? Obedience to the God. If it's Jehovah, if you're a Canaanite, obedience to the gods, plural. 14, verse 10, And his father went down to the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so the young men do. And it came to pass when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. So he's surrounded by Philistine young men. And Samson said, Let me put forth a riddle to you. If you declare it to me within seven days of the feast, and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen garments. Now, the idea of telling a riddle and then 
understanding the riddle and interpreting it is a very Greek culture. So what this is trying to say in the text that Samson is dwelling among the Philistines and he's trying to be a part. He's trying to be accepted. So he's chosen for himself a Philistine wife. In doing so, he's touched an unclean lion. He's reached into the dead carcass and gave that unclean honey also to his mom and dad. All right. Now he's intermingling with the Philistines and to be a part of that custom, he's telling them a riddle. And he said to them, out of the eater comes forth food and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not in three days declare the riddle. And the men of the city said to him, on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? So they guessed the riddle because they asked Samson's bride, what does he mean by this riddle? And he told her, so he keeps on giving in to the Philistine culture. All right. If he keeps on giving in to the Philistine culture, what's going to be left of his origin, of who he is? He's supposed to be a Nazarite, a judge for his own people. But yet he's failing to do this and failing very miserably to remember the title you got to keep the promise. What is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than the lion? And that's what he said to them. And the Spirit of Jehovah came mightily upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon because they got the riddle, and now he's got to give them 30 pieces of garment. And he smote 30 men and gave, uh, gave them changes of raiment unto them. So he, he kills 30 people, once again, dealing with deceased, I guess, and he gives these young men in the town uh, of Timnah, okay, these garments. So we're going to continue with the epic of Samson and Delilah. So stay tuned, stay with me, and we're going to look at some more artifacts, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Thank you. Bible Interact, uncovering the mysteries of the kingdom of God. At BibleInteract.tv, you will penetrate the scriptures of the Bible. At our store, you're just one click away from owning your favorite books, DVDs, or study guides. Earn a degree from our university and watch hundreds of video presentations from biblical scholars, archaeologists, and theologians. By subscribing to Bible Interact, you'll find all the resources you'll need. So why not subscribe today? Go to www.bibleinteract.tv. You'll be glad you did. Interested in studying more about the temple, the Messiah, or what God's plan is for our future? No problem, we've got you covered. With more than 200 DVDs, books, and workbooks, you'll find the answers you've been searching for. Bible Interact, uncovering the mysteries of the kingdom of God.